word out. Get ready. central bank digital currency and how it's been implemented and how it's come in not even sneakily they don't hide in the shadows anymore they tell us
we know what they're saying. We, we, I have a timeline that we're going to go.
take the podium and discuss education. I do want to thank the folks here at, uh, at the Booker Elementary School for the hospitality. Uh, today we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. I have spoken to the Vice President, to the Governor of New York, to the Director of the FBI, and have ordered that the full resources of the federal government go to help the victims and their families and, the, and to conduct a full-scale investigation to hunt down and to find those folks who committed this act. Where a country doesn't escape from that. They, because if you apply this to a family, let's say, let's say a, a family, a, you and your spouse, your debt is greater than your income. It's going to be mathematically impossible to pay that back. What's true for an individual is true for a country. So everything that, that Ross Perot warned about 35, 40 years, it's all came true. Yeah, it's all came true. Yeah, and what's true for a country is true for the world. So the Bank for International, we know what they're saying. We, we, I have a timeline that we're going to go over on central bank digital currency and how it's been implemented and how it's come in, not even sneakily. They don't hide in the shadows anymore. They tell us exactly what they're going to do. Exactly. That's what's so frustrating. If you study it, you know the battle plan, but they know the public doesn't check that out. So, but, but we're able to give it to the public. That could really mess up their operation. We saw bank failure 1.0. It was Silicon Valley, Credit Suisse, First Republic, uh, Silvergate Bank. I mean, all of those. That was just a tremor before the bank. That, yes, I think bank failures 2.0 is coming. I mean, just last week, the CEO of Citigroup, you know, the second, third largest bank in North America, said we're laying off 10% of our workforce. So the CEO of, of Citigroup last week basically said we're laying off 20 or 10% of our workforce. That's over 20,000 people. Well, why, why would a bank in, in a high interest rate environment, you think, oh, they're more profitable. They're making so much money. No, they are not. Because when most of America is living hand to mouth, month to month, paycheck to paycheck, and interest rates keep going up and inflation keeps going up, they can't live. So they're taking more money out of the bank than they're putting in. And there's there's delinquencies. A series of delinquencies leads to default. So it's a bank run in slow motion. Yeah, and I think that the bigger bank run is still coming. The, the one that we saw in March of last year with Silicon Valley Bank. So that's that was, my question. What are the different ways this can kind of unravel? So I think first there's a bank run. People start to pull their money out. Then, then that creates crisis. Now they think, oh, if my bank isn't safe, which is should safest money that we have, it's a bank for crying out loud. You have this, this view of your assets in a bank vault, you know, full of like hundreds just sitting in this vault. That's not the reality. When you deposit money into a bank, it's basically a security instrument. The bank then goes and invests that in companies and stocks and bonds and mutual funds and everything else. Same thing you would accept on a larger scale. But after the crisis of 2007 to 2009, they changed the way that banks deal with money. So most people don't realize this, but you don't own the money that you have in the bank. They do. So in 2009, they came up with a concept called beneficial ownership meaning you gave up your ownership of your deposits to the bank. So that, so we hear the term bail-in, right? Or bailouts, right? Bail-in is when you would- and The last thing that was done was like 15, 16 years ago, in some areas of Europe, they would just grab money out of your bank account. Correct. But they can do that legally. This isn't something that's, that's brand new. Now that's in the FDIC regulations, right? Yeah. So yes, it's, it's under the Universal Commercial Code I think it's 133-1 or something like that, where they changed ownership of your assets to them. It's now collateral, so they can use your assets that you think are yours. It's all debt instruments. It's all debt instruments. You gave it to them, so if they need the money to pay off a debt, the derivatives debt, like and after 2009, they can, and they don't have to ask you, so your money is no longer yours in the bank. If a crisis is so bad, that you can't pay your rent, you can't pay your mortgage, you can't feed your kids, you can't live. So at times of crisis, which happens to be happening during an election year, <laughs> people will say, okay, 
uh, this this is so bad. Banks are shutting down all this this economic failure. We'll give you what you want. Government just will give you away our freedoms. Just take care of us. Make sure that we can still feed our family. This is what's happening right now, right in front of us. And people don't understand. Central bank digital currency is not the savior of the world. It's awful. See, they're marketing it as, hey, we can stop drug trafficking. We can stop human trafficking. We can stop Meanwhile, money laundering. Meanwhile, they run all that. Yeah. And it's like, I want, I don't want that garbage around either, but the flip side oh, of it is- Oh, it's total crap. Well, you know, make all your houses glass in case you might do something wrong, but their houses aren't glass. It, no. it's, it's to control us. While other networks lie to you about what's happening now, InfoWars tells you the truth about what's happening next. Visit InfoWars.com forward slash show and share the link today. Well, I've known who Kirk Elliott is for a while and his research is just spot on. And so, I've invited him to be in studio with us. He sent me a giant synopsis and a breakdown of the economy and predictions and what's happening in the world. We really appreciate him uh, being in studio with us uh, here today. Dr. Elliott has been uh, safeguarding clients' assets with precious metals for over 21 years. His firm, Kirk Elliott Precious Metals, serves over 18,000 clients all over the world and in every state and has also reallocated billions of client assets into precious metals. And boy, was that a good move in the last few years. Uh, he follows the uh, personal and business philosophy of people over profit by focusing 100% liquid on low-cost bullion, gold over silver, and educating investors as why and how they invest to minimize risk and maximize returns safely in a world where our political, economic, and personal religious freedoms are eroded. Dr. Elliott has earned two PhDs, one in public policy administration focusing on monetary economics and the second PhD in theology. Dr. Elliott lives in Denver with his wife and children. KEPM, KEPM.com forward slash gold, KEPM.com forward slash gold, or call 720-605-3900. And, you know, he approached us uh, six months ago, want to be a sponsor. And I said, wow, I've actually seen his videos before, and I've actually told my crew I wanted to get him on as a guest. So I said, sure, be a sponsor. So last time he was on for like over an hour and a half, he never even really talked about his company or what he's doing. But, but I do want to tell people it is a extremely smart move to get into precious metals. And the, 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 the thing to do is the bullion. That is where uh, you are doing a great deal. And he is the place to go. So I, he didn't even want to talk about it. I'm doing it because he's a great sponsor. spiritually america is in this downfall we have amazingly shocking parallels with the fall of rome in america today we've we're going to go over the budget i want to go over the u.s budget that biden put together and just show you how we're way worse than rome was we've got bank failures we've got if you look at the graph of debt since he got it it's going straight up oh straight up it's 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 through the roof um i the viewers will be shocked as to how much we've actually accumulated in just this year. Just in 2023, it was so bad that, that we, we did triple the amount of what took 204 years prior to accumulate. I mean, this is just bad. So so we, we're going to go over that. We're going to go over central bank digital currency, which I believe is their end game. The timeline, not just not just what I think but taking it out of the words for the Bank for International Settlements, the World for Ec Economic Forum, like what you were going over, they're meeting right now to learn how to destroy us. And, and let's out, be right? clear, the Chicom government, the, the German government, the Swiss government, the University of Texas, they're all very, very quietly hoarding gold. Mm -hmm. 
And because they know that, that when we go into this hyperinflation, that's, that's going to be king. Yeah. They've already got their plan B established. It's possibly their plan A. So all the listeners know, and I should have pulled this up, but I know it's in your report here. Anybody can type in U.S. monetization of debt, U.S. debt. And as he said, Biden gets in, it's, it's more money created than ever existed before in just the last three years. There's no way to hide that inflation. So their statement that inflation isn't a problem, we all know that's a lie. It's a lie. Now, I don't know how they're going to get out of it. And even their own cooked numbers, their own cooked inflationary numbers, they said, oh, we can pause interest rates and then we're going to lower them next year because we've won this war against inflation. No, they haven't. They haven't. Our wallets will tell us that. And this is their problem. Oh, yeah. This is, this is their problem. There, there's really no escaping this. And this is why this is an end game moment. But like any end game moment, the battle is at the city gates right now, right? Somebody's going to win. Somebody's going to lose. And this is why it's so intense. That's why it's so intense. As, as Lenin said, evil God, he was right. There are decades where nothing happens. There are weeks where decades happen. And we are now in that point. You do a great presentation. I'm going to try to shut up and just let you roll when we come back. Everybody, tune in. Tell your friends and family. Tune in now. There's going to be life-saving information. Stay with us.
central magnet. You can call it. That's what it is. All right, Kirk Elliott, multiple PhD expert on what's happening. I totally think your analysis is dead on. You brought the receipts. You've got the numbers here. Uh, let's let's start with your presentation now. So first, you know, what's happening to America has been seen before in history with the fall of Rome. It truly, it, it has. And so when, as I was doing some research on this, it's like, what are some of the factors that caused Rome to fall? Number one, they had civil wars, right? They had faction fought against faction to get control of the huge, basically, state apparatus and all of its public. Well, we're seeing that in America. The um, internal fights is what weakened it, just like we see now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Number two, there was mass corruption. <laughs> uh, no, no further explanation needed. We have that everywhere. Huge bureaucracy, high taxes, burdensome regulations. Businesses were called upon to support the growing body of, of public parasites, right? But here's the big thing. One third of the citizens of Rome were getting government payments. Um, and, and basically Rome crumbled under the weight of those entitlements. One third. So as, as I was looking through- Rome my, invented welfare. Yeah, they invented welfare. Yeah, they, absolutely. So I was looking at um, Biden's budget. You go to whitehouse.gov. You can look at the budget, go to table S3, where it actually goes through everything. It just summarizes everything. This is really, really creepy, Alex. So you go to 2024, you look at mandatory programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Medicaid other mandatory programs like food stamps, women, infant, children programs, um, you know, just basically the handouts and the entitlements. Now, Social Security is not an entitlement. It's a mandatory payment, right? You pay into something your whole life, you better get it, the benefit, right? But you try to take that away and you've got a mutiny on your hands. So you can't take it away. So one, it's really easy to give, really hard to take away. So that's not going away. But you add those up on this, on this summary table, $3.916 trillion in just mandatory payments. How much do we bring in as, as a country? Well, our total receipts, our federal tax revenues, are $4.72 trillion. So that comes to 83%, not one third, like when Rome fell, 83% is Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Women, Infant, Children programs, food stamps. 83% of everything we bring in. Now you add to that the interest on our federal debt. Well, it's 47% service it's, it's bonkers because we have $34 trillion worth of federal debt. The interest payments estimated on, on the budget are $796 billion. However, the real numbers just came out. We're pushing a trillion. So when we bring in 4.7 right and we're spending a trillion dollars a year in just interest only payments that's just complete waste well that's over 20 percent so you add up mandatory payments welfare and entitlements plus the interest payments it's 99.8 percent of everything we bring in as a nation it's basically a hundred percent complete waste well that's over 20 percent so you add up mandatory payments welfare and entitlements plus the interest payments it's 99.8% of everything we bring into nations. On the budget are 796 billion. However, the real numbers just came out, we're pushing a trillion. So when we bring in 4.7, right, and we're spending a trillion dollars a year in just interest only payments, that's just complete waste. Well, that's over 20%. So you add up mandatory payments, welfare and entitlements, plus the interest payments, it's 99.8% of everything we bring in as a nation. It's basically 100%. So how then do we fund our defense budget? How about and how about uh, infrastructure? How about running the country? And, and by the way, the IMF and World Bank have done this to a bunch of third world countries. This, they even admit this is a known plan to capture a country. So they've now maneuvered us to the point of total insolvency. Yeah, absolutely. And and. Really, it's so as I look throughout history, whenever a country's debt is basically equal to their gross domestic product. Explosion, explosion, explosion. You got in 
and all the skin was pulled from his under under his arm, all the way to the top of his fingertips, and he was hanging to the bottom, hanging. And then I look at his face, and he was missing parts of his face. And I said, "What happened? What happened?" And he said, "The elevators. The elevators." Jimmy Carr was attending a business meeting on the 36th floor of One Liberty Plaza across the street from the World Trade Center and caught the entire first attack on tape. The windows in the lobby of the North Tower were blown out. Marble panels were blown off of the walls. Mark Loiseau, the president of Controlled Demolition Incorporated, told the American Free Press that in the basements of the World Trade Center, where 47 central support columns connected to the bedrock, hot spots of literally molten steel were discovered more than a month after September 11th. These incredibly hot areas were found at the bottoms of the elevator shafts, down seven basement levels. The molten steel was found three, four, and five weeks later when the rubble was being removed. He said that molten steel was also found at World Trade Center 7. The highest temperature was in the east corner of the South Tower, where a temperature of 1,377 degrees Fahrenheit was recorded. The molten steel in the basement was more than double that temperature. And what's to explain, Governor? The smoke that still comes out. There's still, there's still fire down below. There is such an incredibly deep pile of rubble, and the, the tower goes down five, six stories underground. That uh, there is still fire underneath, smoldering. And pools of molten, molten steel were found beneath the rubble. This is how it's been since day one. Oh, it's unbelievable. And this is six weeks later, almost six weeks later. And as we get closer to the center, this gets hotter and hotter. It's probably 1,500 degrees. We got some small windows into um, what we thought was a portal point. It looks like a, uh, an oven, you know, it's just worn inside. It's just in a bright, bright reddish orange color. These and even more effects point to the existence of very powerful, precisely placed,
electrical engineering for about eight years. I had quite a bit of practical engineering experience. When I first saw the collapses, I was absolutely convinced that they were not spontaneous. Uh, one of the first things that I did was to speak with one of my patients who was a retired Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, he's done a lot of demolition and construction. Uh, I showed him some of the public source videos that are available on it, and he immediately pointed out that there were squibs resemble puffs of smoke essentially coming out of buildings initially, uh, which were clearly a sign of controlled demolition. He had no opinions beyond that, but he said without, without doubt that it was controlled demolition. That sort of set me on the path of continuing to examine it to try and gather as much evidence as I could. And the obvious question is what, what does it mean if it was a controlled demolition that the simplest level means that someone had a lot of access to the building, so a lot of period of time to set this up. The initial FEMA report um, basically acknowledged that the kerosene would have burned off very quickly. What wasn't destroyed in the initial fireball would have been consumed fairly rapidly and would have only really served as an addition for the rest of the material. And the second point being that the, the fuel here really was strictly office contents. If you think of the modern office with copying machines, computers, um, and as has been previously mentioned, the, the smoke, particularly from Building 2, very black looking. Uh, this is generally an indication of an inefficient fire in which there's not enough oxygen for the amount of fuel. These types of fires typically burn very cool. They, they are not hot flames like low torches. Uh, the cores themselves, basically, uh, if you've seen diagrams of the building, there's a large central rectangle in each of the towers that contained 47 columns. These columns basically were the, the primary structural support of the building. They were given the role of supporting the, the whole gravitational load of the building. Uh, since they were so strong, it would have been reasonable to think that they would have withstood, at least to some extent, the collapse. But in fact, as we see after the building was collapsed, there was basically only a little stubs of these things standing up a floor or two above the ground level. The cores did not have much in them that would burn. Cores basically were dedicated to things like elevator shafts, utility shafts, stairways. Uh, so you have drywall material, you have a little bit of carpeting, you don't really have any inflammable material in the core itself. Okay, as far as the issue of what failed and how, uh, some of the initial suggestions, and these showed up in the NOVA documentary, which is a good example of what I like to call proof by computer animation. Thomas Egar, who was a material scientist but not a structural engineer, who became a, a spokesman for these documentaries, uh, indicated that the floors had somehow failed, that the trusses supporting the floors had failed. Uh, this was the, the theory that was put forward actually in the initial FEMA report. Uh, subsequently, there have been basically complete contradictions of that. Uh, Jim Hoffman has done quite a bit of research which is available on the web concerning the, the problems with this idea that the floors would have simply fallen. There was a study done by Weidlinger Associates, the chief engineer there was Mathis Levy, who's a very well known authority on building collapses. He specifically disavowed the idea of taking collapsing the floors. And the most recent official report we have on this, which is from the National model at this point, what NIST has suggested is that there was some kind of simultaneous collapse of the cores, but they have not attempted to uh, give any kind of, of uh, modeling as to whether those cores could have in fact been destroyed by the fires in the way that they claim. Unfortunately, the material that would have allowed a detailed fire analysis, the actual physical evidence, is all gone. Uh, one of the most significant things to, to my thinking is that indicates that this could not have been the sort of collapse that we are told it was is the presence of the dust clouds. Uh, and as you've seen in the pictures, and I'm sure all of us have seen probably more than we would like, uh, there were very, very large clouds of very thick dust that enveloped the area that crossed the river that made it almost all the way to New Jersey from the pictures that I've seen. Uh, this type of flow is something that we are familiar with in physics. It 
occurs in only two situations that we know of naturally. Uh, one is in volcanic eruptions where a large amount of material is suddenly exploded into the air and basically forms small particles. Uh, the other situation is something called turbidity currents. These occur along the edges of the continental shelves where mud or sediment is slumped become suspended in water, and the, the common thread is that you have large amounts of a, a dense material that is suspended very quickly in a fluid, thereby creating another denser fluid, which is in effect the dust cloud, and that fluid can achieve considerable velocities. Uh, the problem with creating this sort of flurry of fine particles is that there really is no mechanism that's proposed. We have concrete floors with carpeting and flooring over them, we have furniture, we have floors basically that are coming together in a collapse, but the concrete is basically protected under these layers. Uh, early in the collapse, in the very first moments, we see these thick clouds being ejected at very high speed. They're clearly dense because they flow downward and become part of this large overall pyroclastic flow. And what we're basically being told is that the concrete sort of jumped up into midair exploded itself and then was ejected as the floors came together. Not a very plausible mechanism, but I, I have yet to hear of, of anything else proposed to explain it. Uh, from quite a few people on the scene, we've been told that the powder uh, represented most of the concrete. The amount of intact macroscopic chunks of concrete on the scene were, were negligible, that basically everything was reduced to powder. Incidentally, we also know that other things besides concrete were reduced to powder. We know the contents of computers, exotic metals from computer chips, these sorts of things were, were also identified in the dust and in very small particles, generally on the order of less than 100 microns in diameter. So we have a real issue of mechanism as far as what in the, in the process of this collapse could cause so many things to be pulverized so finely. For the, the towers to collapse the way we saw them collapse basically implies that the columns simply collapse into themselves. They telescope straight down. Uh, steel keeps a lot of its structural integrity uh, even, even when heated. Until you begin to approach the melting point, you, you don't really see a catastrophic loss of strength. And this is what we're talking about. We're talking about basically vertical box columns collapsing into themselves, which implies a complete loss in mechanical strength. And as far as the initial impacts, this recent uh, NIST study made an interesting point about World Trade Centers. Uh, two, uh, the film analysis showed that, that it oscillated for about four minutes after it was struck by the airplane oscillation rate was identical to what would be expected for the intact tower. World Trade 1 began collapsing from the very top after an hour and 40 minutes. Uh, it's very hard to imagine office contents progressively heating up high, hotter and hotter over that period of time. And for a building to collapse from the very top, which is the least heavily loaded, is also very odd, to say the least. Uh, just a couple of other anomalies, you know, there were reports of explosions, there were reports of underground explosions in both of the towers at the time of the impact from a building engineer by the name of Philip Morelli, there were interviews with him on the web. Uh, from the Nodei Brothers film, 9-11, you see that the lobby of the North Tower was extensively damaged with what looks like an explosive blast damage, and this was immediately after the plane collision. So we know that on the weekend before there were power downs and there appear to have been evacuation drills going on throughout the, the previous week, uh, which suggests that uh, at least some people knew that, uh, that something was happening. The power downs may represent a time window in which demolition charges would have been planted, although I, I think it's possible that uh, they also were planted over a much longer period of time. Yep.
that the interest on our federal debt. Well, it's like 47 percent of service now, right? Yeah, it, it's it's bonkers because we have 34 trillion dollars worth of federal debt. The interest payments estimated on on the budget are 796 billion. However, the real numbers just came out. We're pushing a trillion. So when we bring in 4.7, right, and we're spending a trillion dollars a year in just interest-only payments, that's just complete waste. Well, that's over 20%. So you add up mandatory payments, welfare and entitlements, plus the interest payments, it's 99.8% of everything we bring in as a nation. It's basically 100%. So how then do we fund our defense budget? How about and how about uh, infrastructure? How about running the country? And, and by the way, the island of the World Bank have done this to a bunch of third world countries. This, they even admit this is a known plan to capture a country. So they've now maneuvered us to the point of total insolvency. Yeah, absolutely. And, and really it's, Getting so as I look throughout history, whenever a the country's debt Scott, thank you for making time is for basically it. equal to their gross domestic uh, product, that, that, that country that ceases to exist uh, in its, in its uh, existing uh, form. Why am I Republic Germany? I'm way Africa. Yeah. Um, Argentina, Venezuela, right there is... I worked for, as you said, Fiduciary Trust in the South Tower. I was based on the 97th floor, um, where our data center was. Um, about three weeks prior to 9-11, um, our company, along with many others in the tower, were given notice that there was going to be a power down in the uh, top 50% of floors in, in the Southern Tower. Um, this was unprecedented. Um, as you can imagine, a lot of financial institutions um, in the building, and to have a complete loss of power meant a complete loss of systems. And for an organization like my company, it was truly extraordinary. I mean, people are probably scrambling uh, as soon as they could to, to secure their systems before the power down. Yep, that was part of the deal. Um, Have we, there been, uh, let me, let me, because for the sake of time, I want to keep this moving as much as possible, Scott. Have there been any power downs like this? Again, uh, you were notified by the Port Authority there'd be a 36 hour power down at the top half of your tower. Uh, Have there been anything like this prior to this particular power down? And exactly give us a time frame of, of when you were notified about the power down as related to 9 11. What was the date of the power down, and had there been one prior to this? Okay. The power down was on the Saturday and Sunday prior to 9-11, so that would have been the 8th and 9th of September. We were given three weeks notice. It was relatively a uh, short time uh, notice period to make all the preparations needed. And um, it was unprecedented. We've never experienced the power down in the towers, as far as I am aware. I have worked in the towers from 1998. Um, my colleagues who had been in, in the building well beyond that could not remember an occasion such as this, apart from the bomb incident in the early 90s. Well, let's, uh, let's move to this, uh, Scott, because now the repair, now the power has been down and you see a number of maintenance workers coming into the building. What was, uh, what was in your mind suspicious or notably suspicious about some of these workers coming in to uh, come in for the power down? Actually at the time I wasn't suspicious at all. Um, it was just part of the fact that there was a power down and that there were um, workers in overall um, in the building. But looking back now, uh, you noticed that there were some suspicious behavior with these workers. Well, of course, looking back, you, you question everything, and uh, you wonder, well, the, the main reason, one of the main reasons why I became suspicious was I got in touch with the Port Authority, and I got in touch with the 9-11 Commission to register this piece of information yeah. so that it would be acknowledged. Uh, if only to be thrown away. And I have no Look at how, where we um, are. I remember, Alex, back in about 2007, 2008, 
I was looking at our debt compared to the gross domestic product and we were at about 80%. And I'm thinking, oh my word, I, I don't, I'm getting scared for America because we're approaching that, that D-Day of 100% where a country doesn't escape from that. They, because if you apply this to a family, let's say, let's say a, a family, a, you and your spouse, your debt is greater than your income. It's gonna be mathematically impossible to pay that back. What's true for an individual is true for a country. So everything that, that Ross Perot warned about 35, 40 years, it's all came true. Yeah, it's all came true. Yeah, and what's true for a country is true for the world. So the Bank for International Settlements just came out last week with their projections that by the year 2028, four years from now, 100% of the world, every country in the world is going to have debt that's equal to their gross domestic product. That means the, the world has to go bankrupt because what's true for an individual is true for a nation. What's true for a nation is true for the world. But don't worry, they've got a solution. Oh, they always have a solution. A total cashless society controlling every facet of our lives. Yeah, it, 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 and, and here's where it gets worse because where are we debt to GDP? We're now at 123%. We blew past the 100% in America. We're now at 123. So the, the Bank for International Settlements came out with their numbers also last week. And that's why they're lowering the U.S. government's credit rating. Yeah, this is the, the, because there is no other outcome that other than lowering it. Total global government debt is $97.1 trillion. Our is in America is $34 trillion. Good grief. We're 35% of all global debt just in America. It's like, do we think that we can bypass math and bypass reality just because we're America? No, we've, we've violated fundamental rules of success, biblical models of living, where it says, you know, Proverbs tells us a borrower is a slave to the lender. Well, yeah, we're, we are now the slave to the rest of the world because of our debt, and we can't pay it back. So everything Ron Paul and all of them warned us, we're here. There's no more, oh, our children will be enslaved. Well, yeah, we got old. Now our kids are being enslaved. We're, we're here. We're here. It's not, oh, we don't have to wait anymore and warn people. They're going to see it now. Yeah. Which is a weak point for the globalists. See, we have to take every bad thing as an opportunity. And that's how I see it, because now people are going to finally meet reality. They're, they're, they're going to. And so where, where Rome fell, right, when one third of the population of Rome was was getting entitlements, handouts of some form, there are well over 27 states, Alex, where where welfare payments are greater than having a minimum wage job. For example, in Hawaii, sixty thousand five hundred ninety dollars a year is what you would make on welfare. That's greater than a minimum wage job. D DC, fifty thousand eight hundred and twenty. Massachusetts, five fifty thousand five hundred and forty. The list goes on and on and on. Well, to receive government payments, you can't have another job, or else they cease. So you could sit on a beach in Hawaii, just drinking a mai tai, making. $60,590 a year. Where is the incentive to work? Now, for you, me, for most of your viewers, it's like, we have to work. We're created to work. We're created to do something good, to use the gifts God has given us to change society, to make an impact and have an eternal impact in people's lives. But most of the world would say, why should I work if I don't have to? And, they're, and that's what Gen Z and millennials are saying. And guys, I sent you a clip, the latest in Philadelphia, of the people on fentanyl. Show that clip, because you think that's just isolated. That's all around the place in Austin. There are a lot of people that don't even know how to work, who are like zombies. What are they going to do when this all collapses? Where are they going to be put? Yeah, let me look at this. Wow. Yeah, I mean, sadly, that looks like downtown Denver. It looks like downtown any big city in America. Um, as, I, as I walk to the office, I mean, earlier last week, I was walking to the office and some guy tried to get my backpack, punched me in the head, and now my eye is like all, you know, swollen. But 
But you know, I but I won. <laughs> Just punched him back. But this is the world that we're living in right now, where it's it's economic fallout, economic mayhem always brings social disruption, and that's where we're headed in in this country. Because now, how do you get out of that? How do the governments try to get out of this? Well, you debase the currency. So go back to Rome, right? Look, look on this picture on the screen. Rome is burning. Well, the the denarius, their currency at the time, was once 94% silver. Well, back then they kept shaving off the edges of it, right? That was their version of inflation. So by, by the time that their inflationary cycle was over, that silver denarius coin was only 0.02% silver. That's a decrease of 99.978% of the value of the currency. Of the North Tower on its south face. It was a 47 story tall, 570 foot tall building. And yet, even the FEMA report in the investigation of the collapse of that building again was never hit by a plane. Collapsed at 5 o'clock. In the afternoon on September 11th. But it was in such close proximity to the, to the Twin Towers, and I'm sure that it could pay the price because it was absolutely like what it did. However, again, the uh, NIST investigation said that the damage from the collapse of the North Tower took out structural columns on the south face. If you watch that clip, you can see, depending on the clip you're showing, whether or not the east penthouse begins the collapse. Michael Berger. And yet, and yet, Michael, let me, let me finish though. And yet, the building does not collapse to the south and the east penthouse begins the collapse. Michael, I want to ask you, I've got to move on because there are times when... Yeah, what you see are high shots. Uh, now, here we're going to show you a videotape of the collapse of the shelf. Now we go to videotape the collapse of this building. It's amazing. Uh, uh, amazing, incredible picture work. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen to much on television before them. A building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by World Price Dynamite that knock it down. Let's be the state of this photograph for this graphic for just a second. Well, no, there's number seven coming down. When you think that, that, that part of the component of news coverage around the country every year is the excitement and the fun that people get watching an old building being demolished and they wired very carefully for days and it's a very careful operation for the building comes down. So check this out. The Federal Reserve started in 1913. Prior to that, we had a currency that was backed by gold. Well, after that, you had the, the cartel owning bankers of the, of the Federal Reserve, where they actually charged the US Treasury for printing money out of thin air, right? This is a disaster. But since 1913, the US dollar has lost 98%. 98% of its purchasing power. We're no different than the denarius, which was about 99.97%. So, so here's where we're going down the same fateful path, right? So the writing is on the wall So in, in America. So why is it writing on the wall? Well, we're following that same path. 
America debases its currency just like Rome did. People now want out, but it's becoming increasingly difficult to get out. What do I mean by get out? People want to take their money out of the bank. They want to pull it out because they're afraid of bank failures. They're afraid of their their social security going away. They're afraid of their their 401ks, their IRAs going out. So what happens, what do banks do? I was looking at something that I wrote in 2017. This was before any of the crisis started happening. And, and I was warning people that banks were gonna start restricting withdrawals. They're gonna start freezing accounts and gonna have capital controls. Banks need to keep their money on hand because they're running out. They don't want people to take it out, but people need to take it out to live. This is what happens, and this is why the banking system right now is become in, becoming increasingly unsafe and a dangerous place to And I want you money. to go there, but let me just add something here. When I was having Ron Paul on 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, or five years ago, when, when I was having other economists on, Obviously, it was already way too much debt. We were way worse than Rome then, but not three times worse than Rome. It wasn't 120 something percent. You know, it was it was it was it was 30 to 40 percent. We were we were already at Rome levels, and the the globalists didn't have their cashless society, their their social credit scores ready, their carbon taxes, their their UN treaties to take control of our lives. Uh, on speech and on our bodies through the pandemic treaties. Now, though, they've accelerated and are getting all their I's dotted, all their T's crossed in their own words to bring in the new system. And, and if you look at the IMF, the World Bank, the, the, the Club of Rome, the, the, all these groups, including the, the EU and the UN, they admit the old system's coming down. I played the clips here. And they've admitted we've got to get the new thing ready. It's all going down. So they're not even denying this at policy level. They know the public's like children on average. It doesn't read this. So, yes, things could have gone belly up if they wanted to pull the rug out 10 years ago, 20 years ago. They already had us. But they didn't have the control grid in place for them to be the saviors and get more power. Now it's almost in place. It's like the planets aligning. They're making their move. There's no longer, this is not a prediction. This is a guarantee, folks, that if you take a 357 Magnum and put it to your head and pull the trigger, you're at least gonna be brain damaged, probably dead. The bullet's already fired, it already went through. There's no doubt this is going down, okay? So they can't prop it up anymore. They did it. The new system's here. It's going to be hell, but at least we know what's going on and can get prepared ahead of time. Yeah, and, and so how are people trying to prepare? They're trying to pull their money out of the banks. Really, that's that's only a part of the equation. Right? That, that just accelerates it. Oh, yeah, that accelerates it because during COVID, in March of 2020, the Federal Reserve, with, through Regulation D, what did they do? They basically said, hey, the reserve requirement at banks can go down to zero. Meaning, if you put $100 into your checking account, Alex, um, or anybody watching, the banks could lend out $100. They didn't have to keep anything on hand. Why did they do that? To stimulate the stinky economy during COVID when nobody was spending money, nobody was earning money, there were shelter in place laws, there were companies were closing down because nobody could go out. They couldn't go out to eat. They couldn't do anything. So to try to stimulate the economy, they said, okay, lend out everything 100%. Well, that caused a, a cyclical structural problem. Which was the plan. That's what they did the Which was the banks could lend out $100. Did they do that to stimulate the... Did they do that to st lend out everything 100% was hugely the plan so what's the problem in times of crisis when people aren't working there's more withdrawal when oh yeah that accelerate up to eat they could there were did they did they times of crisis when people aren't up to eat they couldn't do anything lend out everything 100 percent 
lend out everything 100 lend out everything 100 percent well that caused a a cyclical structural problem which was the plan that's why they did the which lockdown. was which was hugely the plan so what's the problem in times of crisis when people aren't working there's more withdrawals coming out of the banks than there are deposits and they had zero capital and now people have maxed out their credit cards that's admitted like 70 percent of people people are living hand to mouth uh, people can't even afford gas anymore Meanwhile, Biden tells us the economy's great. What are they positioning us for? And and how do you guess? Because you've guessed a lot of stuff has come accurate. Dead wreck and how this is going to unfold. Well, I think we saw bank failure 1.0. It was Silicon Valley, Credit Suisse, First Republic, uh, Silvergate Bank. I mean, all of those. That was just a tremor before the bank that, Yes, I think bank failure is 2.0. For the main for the main that, yes i think but to eat they couldn't do anything so to try to still in the economy they said okay lend out everything 100 percent well that structural problem which was the plan that's why they did the which lockdown. was which was hugely the plan so what's the problem in times of crisis when people aren't working there's more withdrawals coming out of the banks than there are deposits and they had zero capital and now people have maxed out their credit cards that's admitted like 70 percent of people people are living hand to mouth uh, people can't even afford gas anymore Meanwhile, Biden tells us the economy's great. What are they positioning us for? And, and how do you guess? Because you've guessed a lot of stuff has come accurate. Dead wreck and how this is going to unfold. Well, I think we saw bank failure 1.0. It was Silicon Valley, Credit Suisse, First Republic, uh, Silvergate Bank. I mean, all of those. That was just a tremor before the bank that, Yes, I think bank failures 2.0 is coming. I mean, just last week, the CEO of Citigroup, you know, the second, third largest bank in North America, said we're laying off 10% of our workforce. Oh, do you see me pointing? Those are clips we're gonna take out and put on InfoWars and put on Twitter, just ignore me.
whole start over on bank failure and, and, and what it means now. We're going to put this clip out. Go ahead. Okay. So, so the CEO of, of Citigroup last week basically said, we're laying off 20 or 10% of our workforce. That's over 20,000 people. Well, why, why would a bank in, in a high interest rate environment, you think, oh, they're more profitable. They're making so much money. No, they are not. Because when most of America is living hand to mouth, month to month, paycheck to paycheck, and interest rates keep going up and inflation keeps going up, they can't live. So they're taking more money out of the bank than they're putting in. And there's there's delinquencies. A series of delinquencies leads to default. So it's a bank run in slow motion. Yeah, and I think the, the bigger bank run is still coming. The, the one that we saw in March of last year with Silicon Valley Bank. So that's that my was, question. What are the different ways this can kind of unravel? So I think first there's a bank run. People start to pull their money out. Then, then that creates crisis. Now they think, oh, if my bank isn't safe, which is should be the safest money that we have, it's a bank for crying out loud. You have this, this view of your assets in a bank vault, you know, full of like hundreds just sitting in this vault. That's not the reality. When you deposit money into a bank, it's basically a security instrument. The bank then goes and invests that in companies and stocks and bonds and mutual funds and everything else. Same thing you would accept on a larger scale. But after the crisis of 2007 to 2009, they changed the way that banks deal with money. So most people don't realize this, but you don't own the money that you have in the bank. They do. So in 2009, they came up with a concept called beneficial ownership, meaning you gave up your ownership of your deposits to the bank. So, the, so we hear the term bail-in, right? Or bailouts, right? Bail-in is when you would- and The last thing that was done was like 15, 16 years ago, in some areas of Europe, they would just grab money out of your bank account. Correct. But they can do that legally. This isn't something that's that's brand new. Now that's in the FDIC regulations, right? Yeah. So yes, it's it's under the Universal Commercial Code. I think it's 133-1 or something like that, where they changed ownership of your assets to them. It's now collateral, so they can use your assets that you think are yours. It's all debt instruments. It's all debt instruments. You gave it to them. So if they need the money to pay off a debt, the derivatives debt, like and after 2009, they can, and they don't have to ask you. So your money is no longer yours in the bank. That's devastating. When people would realize that, it's going to cause a run because the banks should be the safest asset that people have. So if there's, that's not safe, well, I, I foresee the next step is a run on the stock market, a run on all their other investments, because it's like, we don't trust anything anymore. And why are they then positioning themselves for that? To make us bring in the new system. But oh my God, the stock market went down by half. The banks are runs. Don't worry, we have a new digital currency, as, as the EU says. It's ready. Just download this. It's all fixed. Well, okay, so to answer that, I could ask you a question. Let's say we know what they're saying. We, we, I have a timeline that we're going to go over on central bank digital currency and how it's been implemented and how it's come in, not even sneakily. They don't hide in the shadows anymore. They tell us exactly what they're going to do. Exactly. So, so. By the way, I want that up front in the whole interview because we're live right now, but the, 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 the uh, post one will get even more views. Exactly. That's what's so frustrating. If you study it, you know the battle plan, but they know the public doesn't check that out. So, but, but we're able to give it to the public. That could really mess up their operation. Oh, it could because would if if I were to say we have this plan we have this plan where we're gonna uh, disallow you from buying or selling if we don't like your ideology most of these globalists don't like your ideology they don't like mine they don't they've already debanked me they've already got no yeah. idea but if they were to say hey 
We're not going to let you take money out of the bank, buy or sell with whom you want. Um, the ability to cut you off from buying or selling because every evangelical Catholic that I know says, Kurt, this is revelation. They've got to get you to opt into it during crisis. Yes. So how would you give that up, your ability to buy or sell, if a crisis is so bad that you can't pay your rent, you can't pay your mortgage, you can't feed your kids, you can't live. So at times of crisis, which happens to be happening during an election year, <laughs> People will say, okay, uh, this this is so bad. Banks are shutting down all this this economic failure. We'll give you what you want. Government just will give you away our freedoms. Just take care of us. Make sure that we can still feed our family. This is what's happening right now, right in front of us. And people don't understand. Central bank digital currency is not the savior of the world. It's awful. See, they're marketing it as, hey, we can stop drug trafficking, we can stop human trafficking, we can stop money around all that. Yeah, and it's like, I want, I don't want that garbage around either, but the flip side oh, of it's total crap, you know, make all your houses glass, in case you might do something wrong, but their houses aren't glass. It, it's, it's the controls. It's absolutely, it has not, this is not meant to fix the system. This is meant to have complete people control over all of us. Build back better. Bring, get rid of the old system. Factory set, bring in the new. Yeah. So what's been happening over the last year? So actually over the last three years, let's even go back a little bit farther. So we, banks failing are kind of big stories. Everybody talks about it. You talk about it, I talk about it. Nobody talks about it if a branch closes up. Like, let's say you're walking down the street to go for and they're closing, they're quietly, the banks are quietly closing in slow motion. Yeah, and, and, well, in fast motion, but nobody cares, because if you're walking down the street to go for I mean, I'm not in one day, so it's like, it's like a million miles an hour, not a trillion miles an hour. Correct. Yeah, so, if you go down, let's say you, you banked at PNC Bank, and you're walking down the street to the coffee shop, and it's like, oh man, my, my PNC bank has, has plywood on, on the windows. It's closed. He's saying, all right, well, that's sad. Now I have to go three miles down the street to the next branch. Nobody cares about a branch closing. But what if in 2023, over 2,000 branches closed? 2022, over 2,000 branches closed. 2021, over 2,000 branches closed. That's 6,000 bank branches that have closed over the last... Because they don't need worms on the line. They've got us all in debt. Now they're now they're getting rid of the cheese on the mousetrap because we're already in the mousetrap. Correct. So so that doesn't make a story, but it should. With that, right, there are there are bank closings and bank closing branches everywhere. In fact, I've had that experience trying to go to the bank. It's like they're all they're, they're closed them. Yeah. So what is that the equivalent of? When a company starts to run out of money. What do they do? They start to lay people off. They start to, to cut their expenses so, because they want to survive. A branch closing is the equivalent of banks trying to save on All right, their Kirk expenses. Elliott, stay there. Hour number three straight ahead. We'll get into the CBDCs. We'll get into the Castle Society. What's going to unfold next? Stay with us. KEPM.com. We interrupt. See the best movies, watch now. I can feel it's got in the middle. No, I would not be out now. Where are we? Thank <laughs> you. 